All right. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Thank you so much for joining us uh, for our webinar today. Uh, I'm just going to give people about a minute or so just to get settled. Uh, so get settled in your seat, find something cozy, uh, grab a glass of water or your field guide, whatever you need to be nice and comfortable. And we'll get started in about a minute or so. Um, also, make sure that your videos are off uh, and that your audio is muted. Um, again, it just helps our technology run a little bit smoother. Um, since there's probably a good amount of faces out there. Um, but get cozy. We'll get started in about a minute. All right, if you're just joining us, uh, make sure we keep our videos off and our audios muted. Uh, we'll get started in about 30 seconds uh, and we'll start nerding out on some birds. All right, it's just about 11.03. Um, so I'm gonna get started with our webinar so you all aren't waiting around for too long, uh, but I'm sure people will continue joining us as we get started. Uh, so hello, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to our continuing series of birding webinars. Uh, we're happy that we're still doing these. Um, they're really fun. Uh, so we're gonna continue our talk about fall migration today. So my name is Tyler and I'll be your presenter today and we're going to be focusing on how we at Bird Conservancy, uh, how we study migration. So we're going to really go into what our scientists are doing um, and how a lot of scientists actually study bird migration. We will then learn uh, and identify some more uh, species of sparrows. Uh, we'll talk about juncos and their migration patterns um, and also some tricky IDs. Uh, so we will be using a field guide if you if you want to grab one now uh, we'll be using one towards the end uh, to identify some pictures of birds uh, so if this is your first time attending one of our webinars uh, you can catch up on all of the information we've provided uh, we've been doing these uh, since april so we've done a lot of webinars since this whole uh, shutdown happened um, and we have them all on our youtube channel uh, so if you're interested in learning more about birds about migration uh, you can check those out so whether you've attended all of our webinars uh, or this is your first one, I, I hope you enjoy. If you have any questions that come up during the webinar, uh, I see some of you are already using the chat button. So please use the chat window. Uh, that's how we're going to interact today. Uh, just because if we all unmuted, uh, we would probably be here all day. And I know some of us have other things that we need to do. Um, I will try to get to your questions uh, when they arise. Um, but if not, Stacy will be in the the chat window moderating that as well. Uh, we are recording this webinar, so don't worry about scrambling to take notes. Uh, it will be up on our YouTube channel later this afternoon. Um, and I'll send that link out uh, to all of our registered participants, um, along with resources we discuss and, and a PDF of the slides that I'm using. Um, as birders, we get really excited when migration season comes. Uh, it can mean different birds than we've seen all summer, uh, or winter, and also some rarities uh, that stray off course. Um, so luckily birds can be seen anywhere and all year long. Uh, and I'm sure most of us attending this webinar uh, have started noticing different birds in their backyards uh, or noticing that a bird you've been watching all summer is now gone. Uh, so we're gonna get started and dive right into our fall migration uh, second series. Zoom is a platform that we're using for our webinars. Uh, I'm sure many of you are Zoom experts by now. Uh, it's kind of the way that the world works now is all via Zoom. Uh, but if this is your first time Zooming, it does take just a little playing around with uh, and people use it in different ways. So I just wanna point out that your video and your microphone uh, should be off and muted. Uh, it just helps our technology run a little bit smoother. Uh, I'm sure you are all out there looking really nice and and lovely, but uh, we're just gonna keep our videos off uh, for this webinar. 
And if you need to turn your video off or mute yourself, uh, you can see at the bottom of your screen, there should be a, a mute with a red line through it uh, and a camera with a red line through it as well. When I'm in full screen, your screen probably went full as well. Uh, if you need to escape the full screen, um, all you need to do is either push escape on your keyboard or click the exit full screen. At the bottom of your window, you'll see the chat button, which I've circled here in green. Uh, if you click that, that will actually dock your chat window to the side uh, of your screen. And that way we can interact with each other. Y'all can answer each other's questions. Uh, I'm sure there's many of you out there attending this webinar that might even know more than me. Um, so I'd like to learn from everyone. So make sure that we're keeping that conversation going. Uh, make sure you, you send your chats to everyone. Uh, we don't need any private messaging today uh, unless you want to chat a friend or something. So again, uh, Stacy will be trying to get to your questions as they arise, uh, but we'll definitely get to them by the end. Uh, we'll have some time for some Q&A at the end. So we're gonna start out uh, the same way we do for all of our programs, uh, and that's by getting to know you all a little bit better. So in the chat window, uh, if you can please fill in where you're Zooming from, uh, so where you are right now, how many people you're watching this webinar with, and the last really cool bird that you saw. Uh, the cool thing with about these webinars uh, and virtual learning in general is we get to reach more people uh, outside of Colorado. So we'd love to see where people are attending from. I uh, see Florida, which is awesome. Some Fort Collins, yeah, Sandhill Cranes are awesome. Thank you all for filling out the chat. I'm glad we can, we can use it. Ooh, Crow Valley Campground, great campground in Pawnee Grasslands. I love oven birds, they're really cool. Some people from Durango, the foothills of Sierra Nevada. I hope you're not too affected by the fires going on right now. Awesome, so thank you all for, for filling that out. Um, feel free to keep using that chat window. Uh, ooh, Albuquerque, New Mexico. I was actually in Santa Fe last weekend in green-tailed towhees, I love those. Awesome, thank you so much. All right, so a little bit about uh, myself and Stacy. So my name is Tyler Cash. I'm an environmental educator uh, with the Bird Conservancy of the Rockies, uh, and I'm going to be your main presenter for today. Uh, my favorite bird today, uh, like most of us as birders, it probably changes every day, uh, but my favorite bird today is the Lewis's woodpecker, uh, which is in that little picture right there. Uh, this past weekend, I was climbing out in New Mexico and I actually saw one of these fly over the car and I immediately thought it was a crow, but then I noticed the, the green back and the red head. Uh, and I've actually probably only seen like one other Lewis's woodpecker in my life. Um, so that was the second one. I got really excited. Uh, it's always good to see a bird that you haven't seen in a long time. And Stacy Monahan, she's our camp and family programs coordinator. Uh, and she's going to be the chat moderator uh, today. So if you have any questions that come up, uh, she will do her best to answer those questions. Um, and if you have any issues with technology, you can, you can message her as well and she'll try her best. Um, we're all getting a little bit better at technology than we were last year. Um, and Stacy's favorite bird today uh, is the white-throated sparrow. Uh, she told me that she picked this one for today because she loves their song. Um, and she would always hear them back in the forests, uh, back home where she grew up uh, in New Hampshire. Um, so I'm sure some of you have seen these two birds before. Uh, if not, I'm sure you'll see them at some point in your life. All right, so if this is your first program uh, with us, with the Bird Conservancy of the Rockies, I just want to tell you a little bit uh, about our organization. Uh, so Bird Conservancy of the Rockies, we're a conservation uh, nonprofit organization. And our mission is to conserve birds and their habitats. And uh, we strive to do this through an integrated approach of science, education, and land stewardship. So we use the three prongs uh, of our organization to really inform each other and to help conserve the birds uh, across their, their wintering and their breeding grounds, as well as through migration. So our science team, they're out there advancing knowledge. Uh, they're coming up with new technologies and new techniques. Uh, they're really collecting data on the, the health of birds. Um, and we're actually gonna be talking about some ways more in depth uh, that our science team uses technology uh, to advance the knowledge of birds. So we'll be talking about that today. Our stewardship team, uh, they go out to private ranches uh, and they help ranchers make sure that their land 
uh, is as healthy for the birds and the animals as it is for, for their economy and for their wallet as well. Um, so we really try to help both the rancher uh, and the lands. That's our stewardship team. And then our education team, which Stacy and myself are a part of, uh, we just want to inspire the next generation. Uh, the more people that we get to love birds or even just to notice them, uh, the more luck we're going to have in, in conserving them and spreading the love of birds. I'm sure a lot of you are attending this webinar because you love birds, uh, or maybe you're just kind of getting into it. Uh, but we hope to have lots of future bird lovers out there in the world. And our work, uh, it really radiates across uh, the whole breeding, wintering, and migratory ranges of birds. We work from up into Canada all the way down into Mexico along the Rocky Mountain region. Uh, and now with, with our virtual programs, we're actually able to reach people uh, outside of Colorado and outside of the Rockies. Um, so it's great to see our, our work expanding. So in this webinar, uh, we're going to learn a couple different things. Uh, hopefully you walk away with some new knowledge, but we're going to learn what drives birds to migrate, why birds migrate, uh, and, and what kind of just like makes them do it. We're also going to look into how we use research to conserve migratory birds. Uh, so like I said earlier, I'll be talking a little bit about the scientific methods that our scientists use uh, to help us conserve these birds. And then we're going to end the webinar. Uh, by identifying some tricky sparrow and some junco species. Um, we're also going to be talking a little bit more about their migratory range. So we won't just be identifying them. I will also get to know them a little bit better. Uh, so fall, the reason why I wanted to do a, a fall migration webinar, personally, fall is my favorite season of the year. Um, I've always been a big fan of fall. Uh, there's something about it that I just really love. There's a lot of change that's happening, um, and change is really good. Uh, especially if you're in Colorado, I'm sure you got the abrupt change this week. Uh, it was 80, 90 degrees one day and the next day it was snowing. Um, that doesn't always happen, uh, but fall kind of just brings us, you know, those cooler temps. Uh, we get the changing of the leaves. Um, and then of course the birds are migrating through. And for a lot of birds, it's their first migratory journey. Um, it's their first year doing it. So fall is just a really exciting year for me and probably for you. So why birds? Uh, why are you all attending a webinar that's all about birds? Why does Bird Conservancy of the Rockies exist? Um, well, these are kind of the four main reasons why we like to teach about birds. For one, birds are environmental indicators. Uh, they're one of the first group of animals that are gonna be affected by environmental changes. Um, especially right now in the era that we're living in, there's a lot of environmental change going on. Uh, so by studying birds, that's gonna help us uh, learn a little bit more about these changes that are happening. Birds are extremely accessible. Uh, no matter where a person lives, you can find a bird. Uh, if I look outside my window, uh, which I'm close to a city, if I look outside long enough, I'm sure I'm going to eventually find a bird. I'm sure a lot of you have been doing a lot of backyard birding uh, during this past spring and summer. Birds are also really inspirational. Uh, they've inspired us with artwork. Uh, if you look outside uh, up in the sky, you're going to probably see a plane. Um, they helped us with engineering. Birds have just inspired us for ages. And lastly, uh, really importantly, uh, birds provide us an ecosystem service. Uh, so they control pests. Uh, they, do, they do seed dispersal. Uh, birds also help pollinate plants. Um, so without birds in our ecosystems, uh, it'd be a pretty, pretty sad and depressing place. All right, so migration, uh, it's what we're all here to learn a little bit more about. Uh, so in the chat window, please type what you think migration is. Uh, so what is your definition of migration? And also type in why you think birds migrate. I'll pull up the chat. Uh, so yeah, type in your definition of what migration is uh, and then the reasons why birds might migrate. So I see movement from one place to another. Uh, they move to more favorable climates, moving between breeding and wintering grounds. Awesome. Yeah, food, shelter, and warmth. Follow the bugs. Awesome. Thank you all so much for using the chat feature. Um, I love the interaction, even though we can't see each other. Awesome. I love the great definitions. Thank you so much for filling that out. 
So migration, like some of you said, um, is a regular movement of individuals between their wintering and their breeding grounds. Uh, and we can see in, with this map I have pulled up, um, this is a range map and it shows a bird species. I believe this is the clay colored sparrow. Um, there are different wintering, migration, and winter, and breeding, wintering, and migration uh, routes. So this one is moving through that central flyway, um, spends its summers up in Canada, migrates through the Great Plains, and spends its winter uh, in Mexico. So a lot of you alluded to it, uh, but birds migrate for, for some specific reasons. Uh, most birds migrate uh, for their food source. They have to follow where their food source is going, uh, but they can also migrate because of the climate changing as well. Um, so migration, uh, it's seasonal, it's predictable, and it's repeated each year. It's always going to happen. Birds are always going to migrate, uh, unless for some reason uh, the earth changes drastically and we are, have the same temperatures all year long, uh, which some places do, but not the majority of earth. Um, and it, migration occurs when the costs uh, are lower than the benefits of using uh, well-separated breeding and wintering grounds. Uh, so migration can cost birds a lot. Uh, it takes a lot of energy for the birds to move, you know, thousands of miles, uh, but it's also very risky. Um, the mort mortality risk is really high, uh, but it's not high enough uh, for them not to move. Usually when I ask people what migration is, uh, there's always, a lot of us think that they move just because it gets cold. Um, and we don't really think about their food sources as much, uh, but birds, even if they're migratory, they could spend uh, winters in the really, really cold weather and still be warm, uh, but they need the food source that they've adapted to. Uh, so I always like to think about it. I'm sure a lot of us in Colorado probably busted out our, our fancy puffy jackets uh, this past week to stay warm in the cold weather. Uh, those are made from down feathers and birds have a lot of down feathers on their body. Um, so they can stay warm in really cold places, but they have to move based on their food source. Uh, another way I like to think about migration, uh, so if we pretend, all of us humans, uh, let's just pretend that we can only survive off of pizza. Pizza is the only thing we can eat. Uh, we cannot eat anything else. And during the winter, uh, in maybe in the northern latitudes of the United States, all of those pizza places shut down. They're closed, and we live there. And the only open pizza places are down south, maybe in Texas or New Mexico. All of us would have to get up and move down to New Mexico because we need our food source in order to survive. Um, I know I could survive off pizza, but I'd be pretty upset if they closed off during the winter time. <laughs> All right, and migration is a lot more complicated than even just the food source and the climate. Um, what we understand now is much about where they go and when they go to those places, um, but we still have a lot to learn uh, about individual species. So why study migratory birds? Well, first off, most birds don't just stay put. A uh, majority of bird species migrate uh, either just small distances or some of them you know, migrate thousands of miles. Uh, to conserve migratory birds, we must understand where they live across their full annual life cycle. So here at the Bird Conservancy of the Rockies, uh, we use different technologies in order to study uh, bird migration. So we use geolocators, uh, we study stable isotopes, uh, we use sat satellite transmitters uh, in order to track bird migration. And using all of these technologies, uh, we can discover where they spend their winters, uh, but also their key stopover sites along their journey. Uh, if we know that, let's say that Western tanager down there always goes to one location during their migratory season, uh, that means that that location probably has you know, everything they need, great food source, it has shelter and water. Um, and then we're gonna wanna protect those places because that's where birds are moving towards. So here are some ways that we study migratory birds uh, at the Bird Conservancy. Uh, we, we study them in other ways as well. I just wanted to kind of focus on these three uh, main aspects. Uh, so one way that we study birds is by bird banding. I'm sure a lot of you on this this webinar, uh, have seen bird banding before, or you, you've learned about it at some point in your life. Uh, so bird banding is a process of placing an aluminum band with a unique number uh, on a bird's leg. So it helps us find individuals. Geolocators, which we see in the middle of the slide, 
Uh, they're miniature backpacks that detect light levels uh, that can help us track migration routes and identify important stopover or staging areas. And then MODIS, uh, which is something new that Bird Conservancy has become a part of. Uh, it's a network of automated radio telemetry stations that offer an effective method to explore migratory bird movement. Uh, and we're gonna dive into each of these uh, research uh, areas a little bit more in the coming slides. Um, so we'll dive into it. So bird banding. Um, bird banding is the most widely spread used uh, method to study birds. Uh, it's the cheapest and it's the easiest way that we can actually study birds uh, at a large quantity. So by placing an aluminum, aluminum band on their leg, we can help di differentiate individuals. Uh, so we see this picture of a Wilson's warbler right here, um, which we catch a lot of at our bar lake station. Uh, we can't tell one from another unless they have a unique band on their leg. Um, and if we can't tell individuals, then we don't know the health of the population. So banders follow a really strict code of ethics. Uh, and the bird's safety is the number one uh, code when it comes to bird banding. Uh, like this week, we had to close down our banding station because we knew that the weather was too cold and it would cause too much stress on those birds. Uh, so we have to, we'll close down because bird safety is number one. Uh, we don't want to be banding them when there's already too much going on uh, in their habitats. Uh, bird banding stations are set up all over the country uh, and they help bring science and education together. Uh, if some of you attending this call visited our, our banding station, uh, either this year, right, maybe this week or last week, um, it helps us inform people up close and personal and gives them a, a different look at birds uh, when they're in the hand. And we can learn just more about uh, each individual. Uh, our Bar Lake station is open right now and we are uh, accepting visitors on a reservation and registration base. Um, I'll include more information about that in the following email uh, today if you want to come out, if you live in Colorado and want to come out and visit our Bar Lake banding station. The one thing when it comes to bird banding uh, is we have to recapture that bird in order to get any more data on it. So we hope that either we catch a bird that maybe wasn't banded by us or it could have been banded by us years ago. That gives us really good information. It lets us know that that bird's still alive. Uh, we can see if that bird is still healthy. It gets even more exciting uh, if somebody maybe down in, at a banding station down in Mexico or down in Central America catches one of our birds that we banded, that can tell us a lot of information. That could tell us how long it might have taken for that bird to complete its journey. Uh, it could tell us the health of that bird. Is it healthy? Um, we can learn a lot, but unfortunately, as you might expect, we don't catch a lot of the birds that we banned. Um, the chances are really slim for recapture rates. Uh, but bird banding is something that we always, whenever we catch a bird, no matter what scientific uh, project we're working on, we're always gonna place uh, one of these bands on them because it's universal uh, and it's widespread and it's just, the bands are pretty cheap to buy. Um, so from an, an organizational standpoint, um, it's one of the, the most, the best thing that we can do for science is to, to ban birds so we can learn more about them. Uh, if you're still, if you, if you haven't learned about bird banding, uh, Colin Woolley, who's our banding coordinator, he did a webinar a couple weeks back that's all about bird banding. Um, so if you just want to learn more information about it, uh, either visit us at one of our, our banding stations, uh, or you can go back onto our YouTube channel and watch that, that webinar. So another form of migratory research uh, is placing geolocators on specific birds uh, that we want to study, so on a specific species. So we don't, we don't place uh, geolocators on just every bird that we catch, uh, like a bird band, uh, but we place them on species uh, either of conservation concern or a species that we want to learn more about. So Bird Conservancy, uh, we use geolocators uh, to study black swifts, mountain plovers, baird sparrows, uh, among other grassland uh, and mountain birds. And these geolocators show us migratory routes as well as important stopover areas. So little was known uh, about where exactly black swifts spend their winters. So scientists at Bird Conservancy of the Rockies, uh, they started studying black swifts along with other partners 
by placing geolocators on their backs, so those little backpacks that we talked about earlier. Uh, and with those little backpacks, it uh, helped us determine where exactly these black swifts are going. Uh, so we put those geolocators on some breeding sites uh, in the western slope of Colorado, and we were able to get data about these black swifts are flying, you know, along the Pacific coast of Mexico, all the way down into Central America, and then they end up actually wintering in the in the Amazon region uh, of Brazil. And this wasn't exactly known uh, by scientists. Uh, one thing with geolocators um, is with the, with the backpacks, uh, they are made out of a material that will degrade over time. Uh, so sometimes those GPS locators can just fall off. Uh, we may not be able to recover that tag. Uh, but just like with bird banding, we have to recapture these birds in order to get this data. Fortunately, since we're only you know, putting these backpacks on a specific species, uh, this gets a little bit easier because we usually do it on species that return to the same breeding grounds every year. Uh, so every year, our scientists will go out to the same site in Colorado uh, and hopefully recapture birds that have the GPS locators on them. Uh, so the recapture rate is, is a lot higher than, than the banding recapture rate. Uh, I think last year we recovered all of the geolocators we put on um, on the Black Swifts during that project. Uh, so it's cool because it can give us really great information about exactly uh, where these birds are going. All right, so MODIS. Uh, MODIS is a wildlife tracking system, uh, and it's an international collaborative network of researchers that use automated radio telemetry uh, to simultaneously track hundreds of individuals uh, of numerous species. So this can be used for birds, bats, or large insects. And MODIS is a project that we are just really starting with. Um, we just hired on another biologist to help us with this MODIS network. Um, and something that's really cool about it uh, is it's all about community science. It's all about researchers coming together uh, in order to help with bird and insect health. Uh, so these stations that are constructed, uh, they're maintained by a community of researchers, organizations, nonprofits, governments, and individuals. And it requires a central database. So there'll be one central database that we, or any researcher can gather information on. The great thing about MODIS um, is we don't need to recapture a bird uh, in order to gather the data. So we can see in this uh, infographic here uh, with this Swainson's thrush, it has this nano tag on its back. Um, and the nano tags, uh, they are tags that can actually be received from pretty far distances. They're long range tags. Um, they cost a little bit more money. Each nano tag costs around $200. Um, and if they fly over one of these tracking stations, we can see a picture of this telemetry tracking system right uh, on the left hand corner of that infographic. Uh, it's going to ping um, some data. It's going to let us know that that bird flew over that station. Uh, so if you go back to this map right here, all of these little yellow dots are MODIS stations that have been constructed. Um, so if a bird that has a nanotag flies over any of those stations, we'll be able to gather data on that. So with Bird Conservancy, we currently just have two stations installed, uh, but over the next year and a half or so, uh, depending with the COVID situation. Uh, we plan to install around 40 stations or more across the Great Plains into the Chihuahuan Desert. Uh, we currently have funding for 40 stations, uh, which is a pretty great number. Uh, and we've also applied for funding for about 20 more stations. So the reason why we want to get into this MODIS research uh, is because grassland birds are in a very steep decline. They're one of uh, the species of birds that are in the steepest decline out of any bird species. Uh, we've lost around 53% of grassland birds since the 1970s. Uh, so these MODIS stations were, are just another way to help us uh, inform good conservation practices uh, on grassland birds. So here's a photo uh, of some of us from the Bird Conservancy constructing a MODIS tower out of the Rocky Mountain Arsenal National Wildlife Refuge, uh, which is just right outside Denver, Colorado. Uh, it's a great birding place, so we're happy that we were able to construct one of these uh, MODA stations there. Uh, so we're partnering with different wildlife areas across the Great Plains uh, in order to place these towers and fill in the gaps. Uh, so there's a lot of engineering and construction that goes on uh, with these MODA stations. 
Um, I was out there and I learned a lot about attaching cables um, and about engineering. Uh, it was a really fun day and these towers are really, really interesting. So here's a map uh, that I pulled off of MODIS uh, and I'll send a link to everyone about MODIS to learn more about it. Their, their website's really informative um, and helps you dive in a little bit more. Uh, but we can see all of these yellow dots. Um, most of them are centered along the Eastern seaboard uh, and the Northeast and even you know, some down in Texas and Florida. But we see this huge gap in this, the Great Plains area. Uh, we can actually see the two little dots in the middle uh, those are the two MODIS stations we've just uh, constructed. The one above the United States, that's Soapstone National uh, Area, which is just on the border of Wyoming and Colorado outside of Fort Collins. It's a great place to go birding. I've never been, but I've heard great things. And the other little dot was from that picture that I just showed of the, the arsenal, the Rocky Mountain Arsenal. So our scientists, uh, our full annual cycle team, they're constructing these MODIS stations, and we're hoping just to fill in the gaps so we can learn more about where exactly these birds are migrating. And we're also partnering with people out west because we see there's a huge gap of these MODIS stations out west. Um, and they actually don't take up a lot of space. So you see all these yellow dots, uh, but they don't take up a whole bunch of space. They're just little radio towers. Um, so MODIS is really cool. I highly suggest you to check out the website um, and I'll send that to you uh, in a future email. All right, so I've been doing a lot of talking, so it's going to be come down to time for us to kind of put our knowledge together uh, in order to identify some sparrows and juncos. Uh, but before I move on to that next spot, uh, I'm just going to check the chat real quick to see if there's, I see a lot of questions probably popping up. Um, yeah, so I just, I, I'm glad that Lynn's noticed this, um, that there aren't a lot of stations either in the Pacific Flyway or the Central Flyway. Um, and it's because uh, Birds Canada is uh, one of the organizations that started this and that's out in, the, in Eastern Canada. Uh, so the East Coast really caught on to MODIS early on um, and kind of it's taken a lot longer for it to move West, um, but that's something that we're starting to help with. Uh, it is a fairly new technology. Um, Use, it's using old technology and making it a little bit more new. Uh, so these stations, hopefully, the more that we have up, the more that we're gonna learn about where exactly these birds are moving. Um, oh, great question, Stephanie. So they, they don't have to fly too close. We're actually, uh, right now we're using drones with tags to see how far exactly, uh, how far away a bird needs to be from that tower. Um, so it is a long range detection. So each tower, um, ideally, would be around like 50 miles to 100 miles apart. Uh, and a bird only needs to be within um, about a, a mile or a little bit more for it to detect that, that bird. Um, so they don't have to fly right over it. There's a, a pretty large buffer zone um, from the MODIS tower that will actually de detect the bird. Uh, it's really interesting. Uh, I highly suggest you guys to check out the, the MODIS website. Um, and if you are somebody that owns a lot of land, uh, you can be a host. You can actually have a MODIS site on your on your own land um, if you want to you know help birds and help uh, if you have that that area of land all right so we're going to get into our our bird identification fun now so if you do not have a field guide um, it's a good time to to grab one um, or if you already know a lot about sparrows and juncos uh, and you can use your your field guide in your head that's okay too um, it's gonna be like a learning celebration, like a quiz. Uh, we're gonna learn a lot about them, but if you know it right away, if you know that bird species, uh, maybe just give it a little bit. Uh, I know sometimes when I'm out birding, I get really excited and I think a bird is something that it's completely not. <laughs> uh, so I always like to say, when you think you know it, take a, a little closer look and take like a breath and really look at those field marks uh, because it might be a different bird than what you think it might be. I remember just do your best. Uh, unfortunately, the pictures that I have, uh, they're not to scale. Um, I don't have any videos or even sound of the birds. Uh, so really just working off a photograph uh, and just do the best you can and have fun. Um, one thing I always like to tell people is it's 100% okay to be wrong. Uh, most of the time when you are wrong, that's when you're going to learn something. Um, so don't, don't feel bad if you, you throw out an answer and you get it bad. I'd rather have uh, folks guessing than, than not saying anything at all. 
Um, and even if you don't know the name of any of these birds, uh, feel free to type into the chat what you notice about the bird. Uh, so maybe you notice it has stripes or a black head. Uh, that's gr a great way to learn uh, by filling those out. All right, so we're gonna start with our sparrows. Uh, so our new world sparrows is, is what we'll be focusing on. Uh, and sparrows, they belong in the class Aves. Uh, and the order that they belong into is Passeriformes, uh, which are the songbirds. So most of us consider uh, birds that sing, they're songbirds, that's the Passeriformes group. And the family for sparrows uh, just recently changed. So your field guide might actually say something different. Uh, but they belong in the family of Passerillidae. And as we learn more about birds, uh, taxonomy is always changing. Uh, so some birds change families, some birds become their own family. Uh, so it's something that's constantly changing. Sparrows can be really challenging uh, to identify. Sarah, our other environmental educator, actually did a webinar all about sparrows. Um, so if you want to watch that on our YouTube channel, you could dive a little bit deeper than what we'll go over now. Um, again, since this is a fall migration webinar, I kind of wanted to focus uh, a little bit more about on the mig migratory patterns. Um, so if anyone knows these two birds, I'll pull up the chat uh, of the pictures I have right here. Uh, I see that people are starting to enter it in. Um, the top is a song sparrow. Um, also, if you know these birds, I would love for you to enter why you think it is what it is. Um, so the top is a song sparrow. When I identify song sparrows, um, I'm always kind of looking for this, this chest dot. Uh, they're really common. Um, they have that streaky head. Um, and usually the habitat that they're in is, is really, really distinctive as well. And their song. And the bottom, uh, that is a Lincoln sparrow. Uh, so good job. We have some, some good birders on our hands. Yeah, the Lincoln has that little crest. Um, it has this streaky breast and the tan mailer stripe. Awesome, so we'll keep it going. All right, so here's our bird. Since this is uh, a fall migration webinar, I tried my best to uh, find pictures of young birds, of hatch year birds. It makes it a lot more challenging for sure, uh, but I feel like that's a, the fun part about fall migration um, is we get these young birds that are moving through and they look a lot different than the adults. Um, so I'll show the young bird first. Uh, and then I will actually show the adult after that. So this bird um, is a, a fairly common sparrow. Um, it, you can find them, uh, they nest in chaparral and other brush surrounded habitats. Um, in summertime in, here in Colorado, you can see them up in alpine meadows or in the tundra. Uh, and they are often in flocks and they forage on the ground uh, just like like most species of sparrows. Um, so I see, thank you all for just for, I, I know a lot of us don't like to use the chat window, but thank you so much for using it. It's a great way uh, to interact when we can't actually see everyone. I, we're getting some, some different answers, which is great. Uh, so I will show you the adult and that might help narrow it down. So the juvenile, uh, we can see on the upper left, it has the kind of a, a lighter brown crown, uh, it has some white wing bars. Uh, the adult is at the bottom. I think it's really striking. Uh, it's one of my favorite sparrows. I love these sparrows. Um, and I think someone, we, yeah, Dara said that it was a juvenile white crown. Uh, so this is a white crown sparrow. Uh, it's named for, of course, it's adult white crown uh, on the top of its head. Um, and they start to come down to, um, can you, you'll get white, white crowns will start, they're, they're starting to migrate down from the Alpine. So I'm sure we'll see them in our yard soon. Uh, good job, everyone. I wanna show this, this abundance map. Um, so this abundance map, I grabbed this off of ebird.org and it's gonna show us uh, where these birds are during different times of the year. Uh, so we see on the right, it says the week of the year. Uh, so it goes from January to December and it's gonna be a little video. Uh, then the relative abundance is just how many birds uh, have been seen in that location. Uh, so I just want you to observe where these white crowned sparrows, where they breed, um, and also where they come down to winter. So we, these are really fun to play with um, if you like nerding out on, on cool graphics. Uh, the abundance maps are really cool. Uh, so you can see uh, where the right, white crowned sparrows, they spend their summer up in the high altitudes uh, of mountain ranges, 
uh, or out up in northern Canada and Alaska. Uh, and then I'll be showing, I'll play this one again, but I'll be showing these for most of these species because it, I just like to nerd out uh, and watch these because they're really cool just to see, see the movement of the birds during the migration season. And you see them moving right back down. Um, so you can see these pretty much throughout North America at some point in time. All right, here is our next bird. Uh, again, I'm going to let you know already that this is a hatchier bird. Uh, so it's going to be a little more difficult to identify. All right, so one thing I notice about this bird, um, it's got a pretty streaky breast, uh, but I'll let you know that the adult actually does not have that. Um, Another field mark I really like to look at is it has this kind of faint line through its eye. Uh, that's something that Meredith, one of our bird banders, uh, really pointed out to me and something that I remembered. Um, you can see these birds uh, in open woodlands or suburban parks and neighborhoods. Uh, and we're starting to get some answers. Awesome. So we have Heather thinks it's a chipping sparrow and Dara says a juvenile chipping sparrow. Again, I mean, sparrows are, they can be so hard to identify. <laughs> um, uh, and we're actually kind of, I still have a lot more to go through. Um, so I'm going to show you the adult. And that might help you really narrow down. The adult's a lot more distinctive than the juvenile. Um, but I think that's what makes birding in the fall so fun is we have so many young birds that look different. Um, and you can really see in the adult the line that goes through the eye. Um, but with all birds, uh, as much as you can, you really want to look closely at it. Uh, so this is indeed the chipping sparrow. Um, so good job. Thank you all for, for giving it a shot. And here's the abundance map of the chipping sparrow. So we can see, uh, let's play it. They spend their winters down in Mexico and then in the southern United States. Uh, and then they'll migrate through and spend um, the summer up in, in Canada and in higher elevations as well. I'll play that one more time. Just they're fun to watch. Uh, and so the darker purple it is, uh, that's more eBird account. So that's more people seeing that bird in that location. Uh, so there's just more of them around. All right, and we're gonna do uh, our last sparrow here. Um, and I actually couldn't find uh, a young bird of this. So here's the adult. Um, this bird is one of the smaller sparrows. Uh, whenever I am identifying sparrows, I like to separate them from having a streaky breast uh, or having just a plain breast. Uh, so we can see this one actually doesn't have any streaks on its belly. Um, the sparrow is really small, um, so it's smaller than a lot of the other sparrows we, we had so, so far. Um, it has that, that pay, it's kind of just pale uh, and kind of buffier overall. It has this tan malar stripe. Um, these are common in the Great Plains. Uh, so if you're joining us from Florida, uh, you might, you don't get to see these that often. Um, and yes, it is smaller than a finch. Uh, good question, Renata. Uh, that's one thing when you're <laughs> IDing birds on a webinar or on the computer on pictures, uh, it's really hard to see the, the size and the size is really important uh, when we're identifying birds. And yeah, like Diane said, it has that faint eye ring that goes all the way around its eye. You're getting some great answers. So this one uh, is actually a clay colored sparrow. Um, so the clay colored sparrow, uh, they spend their winters down in Mexico. Uh, they migrate through the, the Great Plains and the Midwest, and then they spend their summers up in the, the Northern United States and up into Canada. So I'll play this abundance map for you. So we can see the clay colored sparrow now it's starting to migrate through and they migrate through in pretty large flocks. Um, we've been catching them out at our banding station uh, at Bar Lake. Then they spend their winters really uh, far down in Baja and down into Mexico. Um, so something interesting about when sparrows are migrating, uh, we think migratory birds usually are the ones eating insects. Um, and most sparrows eat, eat seeds, but some of them also do uh, subside on, on insects and bugs as well. Um, so they still need to move from their breeding and their wintering grounds. All right, so now we're gonna talk a little bit more about dark-eyed juncos. Uh, dark-eyed juncos are super interesting little birds. Um, I personally love these birds. They're, they're so interesting to watch. Um, you may be thinking to yourself, uh, well, juncos, 
they're in the Sparrow family. Uh, they're in the Passerilla Day family. Uh, why did I decide to separate them? Um, and I personally decided to separate the Juncos uh, from the New World Sparrows, uh, just because they have this huge range of geographic variation. Um, so they are a really distinct and interesting species within the Sparrow family. Uh, there are around 15 different described uh, subspecies or races uh, of Juncos. And there are six forms uh, that are more easily identifiable in the field. Uh, so these learning celebrations coming up, we're gonna we're gonna dive into those different races uh, and the regions that they're fine, that they're in. Uh, so juncos, this they're adapted to to life on the ground. Uh, they spend around sixty five percent of their time uh, on the ground foraging for seeds. Uh, they even nest on the ground, so they usually nest within uh, rock crevices or underneath big branches. Um, they're mostly gray or brown birds uh, with pink pinkish bills. Um, and another field mark that I really enjoy seeing when they fly off are their white outer tail feathers. Uh, it's another great identifying mark. So we can also separate these different races based on the region. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, and here's just a quick little abundance map. So if you're in one of these states and you're, you're maybe you've never seen a junco before, um, you can see when you can actually see them. Uh, so in the winter is when they come down uh, out of the mountains, out of the northern latitudes and spend most of their time in grasslands or you can see them in parks. Um, you can see down there that they're most of the lower 48. Uh, so we're gonna separate them based on, on their races. Uh, so if you have your field guide open, uh, you can just turn to the page with the juncos on it and that should make it a little bit easier. Uh, so we're gonna start out with this junco right here. Um, so we know that they're all dark-eyed juncos. So I want you to tell me what race they are. Cool, someone had a hundred of them under their bird feeders just before the snow. So this junco is mostly seen uh, out west. Um, and you see it coming up right now, Oregon. Yes, this is the Oregon dark-eyed junco. Um, and we can, we can tell that these are the, the Oregon ones because they have that black kind of hood. Uh, they're a little more brownish with that pink bill. Uh, ooh, Tracy, you have the yellow-eyed juncos. Uh, I had the pleasure of seeing the yellow-eyed junco when I was in Tucson, Arizona. They're so cool. Um, we actually want, I don't have the yellow-eyed in here, but um, they are a really cool type of junco. So when I think of dark-eyed juncos, uh, I think of the Oregon race. Uh, I grew up in California and I learned how to bird in California. Um, so whenever I think of a junco, I automatically think of the Oregon race. Um, yeah, thanks, Lynn. Uh, Dr. Ellen Ketterson, uh, she does a lot of research on juncos, um, which I'm sure some of that is recorded somewhere. So if you want to check her out, um, juncos are extraordinary. Uh, so that's the Oregon dark-eyed junco. We're going to move on to the next one. Um, and the Oregon's mostly seen out east. So this one is another uh, type of junco race. Um, and two of these actually look pretty similar. Um, uh, in this picture, the, the snow might be giving away the location <laughs> of where you can see them. Um, but actually, the first time I saw this bird, I was on a road trip uh, out to the East Coast where I was going to work for a summer uh, and a spring. And I saw this bird when I was camping in North Carolina, and it just stumped me. Uh, this was probably like a year after I started birding. And I just had no idea what this bird was, um, just because I, I was so used to juncos out west. Um, so this junco can see more, uh, you can see them more out east. Uh, they're mostly the black and kind of gray with that white underbelly. Um, and it's still, they still have that pinkish bill. Um, so this one's really common um, out east. And I see some of us are going between the slate uh, and the white winged. Um, so this is indeed the slate color dark eyed junco. Um, so this one is uh, again more common. I like talking about the regions because coming from a West Coast and being a West Coast birder uh, and then going to the East Coast. I had, had no idea what this bird was uh, when I had pulled out my field guide. I was like, oh, it's a dark-eyed junco. Um, I just didn't realize that there were different races of them. Um, so that's pretty interesting. All right, so now we're gonna do a little bit of a rapid, rapid round with the rest of these races, uh, which I think these can be a little bit harder to identify um, personally. So, oh, I gave a, that one went a little quickly. <laughs> Uh, so this one um, can be seen uh, more in the Rocky Mountain region. Uh, it has more of a gray head. 
uh, and these kind of like rufous under its flanks. Um, some of you might have saw the answer already, so feel free to, to type it in if you know it. Um, I, I didn't see these jun juncos for a while uh, until I moved out here to the Rockies. Um, thanks, Dara. Yeah, these are the, this is the pink sided junco. Um, so the pink sided junco, uh, we'll actually, we'll be able to compare it with the, with the next one because they can look pretty similar. Um, so here's the pink sided junco. And here is another one uh, that's a little different than the pink sided. Um, they look, they're gray overall, just like that pink sided junco. Uh, but as you can see, they don't have that rufous red underneath uh, its flanks right there. But this one, uh, I like to think of, it has that like kind of black mask around its bill. It has that rufous red back, uh, which is a great field mark. Um, and yeah, that full pink bill. Uh, so this is the gray headed juncos. Uh, yeah, great question, Diane. Um, all juncos, they do have white outer tail feathers. Uh, and you can usually see them when they, when they fly off from one place to another, they spread their tail out a little bit more. Um, so that's a gray headed junco. Here's our next one. You might be like, Tyler, we already saw this one, but this one is a little different um, than the slate colored. So this is not the slate colored junco, but it's one that looks really similar uh, to the slate colored. Uh, the difference with this one is I, I think that personally they're a little more gray. Uh, their head's a little bit lighter gray. And then they have a little bit more barring uh, of white on their wings, uh, which I can kind of give it away. It's named after the color of its wings and it is uh, a white winged dark eyed junco. So good job, Lori and Tracy and Karen. Uh, I love people that you're just rapid fire on these, these, these questions. Uh, so I was gonna get a little tricky now. So this one, this is where juncos start to actually really get interesting um, and a lot more tricky to actually identify. Uh, so we'll see if anyone actually knows this subspecies. Um, this one actually you probably can't, I don't think they have, they don't have it in the Sibley field guide at least. Um, Sibley kind of just describes the, the main six races. Uh, and this one's a little bit different. Uh, it was actually kind of hard for me to find pictures of this one. Um, all right, we're getting some answers red bagged. The Cassiara. So this one um, is interesting. I actually saw one of these this past winter. Uh, this is the Hymalis. Uh, so this is an intergrade. So juncos, we have these six different forms, uh, and when their ranges come together, they will act, they will interbreed, and so they cause all of these different uh, more subspecies. So like I said in the beginning, there can be up to fifteen different types. Uh, of juncos. So this one is actually the Oregon race that bred with the slate colored. So this is the kind of the West Coast and East Coast coming together uh, into one. Um, yeah, integrates, <laughs> uh, they can be so crazy. Um, they're so, they can be so hard to identify and really tricky. Um, so even though we, most of us know these, these forms of juncos, there's a lot that, that we don't know. Um, so I challenge you all this winter to, to take a little closer look at the juncos that you're seeing, because uh, you could be actually seeing intergrades. Um, by first look, you might think that this is an Oregon junco, um, but this is actually the Oregon and the slate, the high mollus. So great job, uh, everyone. Uh, if you are attending this from somewhere in Colorado along the front range, uh, we can see like all of the different races during winter time and even some of these intergrades too. So. I challenge you next time you go birding, uh, especially around your area in the winter, uh, to see if you can try to decipher some of these intergrades uh, or the different races or subspecies that you see. All right, so we're getting towards the end of our time here on this webinar. Um, so thank you for joining us. But I just want to I like to leave people with just saying that, that birding is a skill uh, and it takes a lot of practice. Um, that's why usually if you're a birder, you're a birder for life. Uh, you never really stop doing it because uh, like, just like with those integrades, um, it gets really tricky. And especially during fall migration as well, uh, when there's so many young birds flying around and they don't have their adult plumage. Um, I think the harder that birding becomes, or the, the more you know about birds, honestly, it feels like the less you know, uh, because you're, you're questioning yourself a little bit more. Um, and then, then you can just learn more from your experiences. Uh, so whether you're attending this webinar and you might be seven or eight year, years old, uh, or whether you're an older birder, I'm sure we can all attest uh, to our love for birds uh, and the challenge that we get when we, when we try to identify them. Um, 
So go out and challenge yourself. Uh, maybe try to find some of those integrated juncos or those young sparrows um, during this winter. So keep in touch with us. Um, as everyone I'm sure is aware, the COVID situation uh, has changed a lot of what education looks like. Um, and coming from uh, the education department, um, we're constantly trying to adapt our programs. Uh, we are offering some in-person programming, which you can find on our website, uh, but we're also still gonna be offering these digital ones as well. If you are in a position uh, to help these education programs going, uh, especially during these uncertain times, uh, please support us. Um, you can go onto our website at bergconservancy.org uh, slash donate. Um, we've been getting so many great donations and, and just quotes from people uh, during these times, and I know it makes us feel really good uh, about what we're doing and what we can continue to do. Um, so I'll include a lot of information in our follow-up email after this, uh, but we'll give a little bit of time of Q&A and I'll see uh, if I can answer uh, any of your questions, but we'll also be back uh, next month in October for another round of webinars. Uh, we have not decided what we're going to do yet, uh, but we will be back for more webinars uh, starting next month. Um, so I'm going to pull up the chat if there's any questions that you may have, but if you need to take off, uh, thank you so much for joining us. I hope you learned something new uh, about fall migration, uh, and I'll stick around for a couple more minutes to see if there's any questions. And Stacey, if I missed any, uh, you can let me know. There was a really good question asked earlier, um, and I feel like we can probably send it out in the, the group email once we're done, but someone wanted to know if the migrating birds will like detour around the smoke or how it affects them with all these wildfires. Um, I think that's an awesome question, yeah. and I feel like I can reach out to our biologists on staff to see if they have a better answer, because I feel like it definitely would affect them, but I'm not sure to, to what extent. Yeah, I know there's, there's a lot of research that's still, I mean, still even going on about birds in, in fire burned areas. Um, actually, I've gotten this question a couple of times from people just in, with in-person programming, um, and I don't have an exact answer. Um, birds have been around uh, the fires and uh, for, for a very long time, there's you know, always kind of been wildfires, uh, but they've gotten worse throughout the years as we might know. Um, I'm sure because birds, they, they have really high oxygen rates. They take in a lot of oxygen into their lungs. Um, so smoke can really affect them really greatly. Uh, so I'm sure if they're migrating, uh, they would try to go around the smoke rather than go into them. Um, but that's a great question. It definitely, I know I wanted to research it um, and there's research going on right now. So I don't have a, an exact answer for, for anyone like Stacy, but uh, I challenge you to, to maybe do a little research um, and we'll do some more as well. It's a really great question. Uh, and I see a question about how to attend banding at Bar Lake. Uh, I'll send out uh, the registration link, uh, but basically you can go onto our website, onto our events. Uh, and what we're doing is we're allowing small groups, so groups of six people, up to six for each hour. So from eight to nine, nine to 10, or 10 to 11. Uh, and you have to register for that spot. Um, you also have to wear a mask and we do keep social distancing, uh, but we really want people to, to be able to see this in person. Um, so if you go onto our website, onto our events, you can see uh, where you can register. Um, but we, we have it going off until October 11th. So we hope that some of you can attend our banding station. Uh, it's really great to see them up close and personal. Yeah, I like that about the Kirkland's warbler. Um, also the black-backed uh, woodpecker. So after fires, it uh, does provide more habitat uh, for some birds that might be more, more adapted to living in those areas. Um, so you know, if you go birding in a, a recently burned forest, uh, you're gonna see some, some birds that are adapted for those areas. Great questions. Were there any other questions, Stacy, that I might've missed? Uh, I saw there's some stuff about MODIS that was coming up, but I kind of missed that. Um, again, their website tells you so much more than I could have just done. Um, our science team actually just did a two hour webinar yesterday all about MODIS. Um, so we at Bird Conservancy are really excited about it. Yeah, yes, I put the MODIS website in our chat box. So hopefully people were also able to get that link then. Um, and the only question is, how do you get your land to be like MODIS certified? Um, cool. Maybe that website has a bit more information on it. Yeah, the, the website has a whole bunch of information about, you know, how much it costs, how to maintain them. 
Uh, but they're basically just these, these radio towers that are put up. Um, and if you, you can find it on the, they have a lot of information on the website about it. Uh, but basically you'd be kind of a, the, the caretaker. Um, so as we know, a lot of weather events can happen. Uh, so if you do have a weather or a motor station on, on your property, it's a great way for biologists to know that it's being taken care of um, and that they don't have to spend more time going out and checking on them. Um, so yeah, feel free to check out that MOTA's website. It'll tell you so much about how you can actually have a station on your land. Awesome. That's, I was going to say, that's all the questions I saw. Um, yeah. We just had a couple more. come in. Yeah. So um, with the MOTA stations, uh, we, we're using them for specific species. So we're going to be studying grassland species like baird sparrows, uh, long spurs, and we're gonna uh, put those nano tags on those certain bird species, uh, hoping that we can, when they fly over those motor stations, we'll be able to collect the data. Uh, but we will also uh, apply a band to their leg as well. Um, banding is kind of our, our default in research is, you can use all these other things, but we'll always band them if we have them in the hand. And I see, uh, do birds migrate sooner than they should uh, with this drastic change? Uh, so, Basically what is happening in Colorado right now with this crazy weather event uh, is what we call a fallout. Um, so this storm came in, a really extreme storm, uh, happened at night. Uh, so all those migrating birds that were in the air, uh, they just basically fall out of the sky and find any shelter that they can. Um, and then they'll wait it out. So they'll actually wait and stay here and refuel uh, before they find more optimal weather to, to migrate in. But this whole, if birds are migrating sooner based on even climate change, um, it's something that we're all researching right now uh, because the, it is getting warmer earlier and it is even maybe getting colder later um, and birds will adapt to those seasons. So it might push them back a week or push them forward a week, but it's, um, it's driven by the climate and they, they know that when it's time to migrate. So great question, Maria. Well, I just want to thank you all so much. We're, it's just about 12 o'clock right now, a little bit over. Uh, thank you so much for your questions. I hope you can join some of our digital banding programs um, or see us out in person out of the banding station. Uh, we will keep these Zoom webinars going on into the future. We don't have any plan on stopping. Um, but unfortunately, we don't have them every week like we used to. We were starting to run out of topics. Um, but we will be back next month uh, with some more, more webinars. Um, and we do offer uh, digital banding right now too. So if you're not in Colorado, uh, we have live banding programs uh, from Bar Lake uh, from 8 a.m. to 9 a.m. Uh, so check that out on our website and you'll look forward to the recording uh, as long as some more information on the, my email later today. Uh, so yes, there'll be the, the recording later today. So thank you so much. I hope you all have a wonderful day and I hope you get to see some birds uh, either this weekend or later today. Uh, so have a good one.